Will bringing your cycle times down improve your profitability? Is this a turned part? This week's Swarf and Chips unveils the secrets behind this multi-million pound company. I was the kind of that kid at school that never, always did great in the test, but always failed dressing uh, everything else. And that was my parents always doing things. So I always, you know, if he could only apply himself, he'd do really well, do really well. And of course I never did. I was only interested in all, all I cared about at school was racing motor, motorcycles around an orchard, to be honest, and making it go as fast as I possibly could. Uh, when I got to, when I actually managed to get my apprenticeship, which was, which was, uh, I was really kind of proud to do. But I made the kind of comment regarding me being one of 55, really to illustrate the point. I think the change because nowadays we advertise for apprentices, we look if we get any applicants. So when I got that, it was out of me finding it because I knew what I knew what I wanted to be. Uh, you know, because they thought I was good with engines, they kind of suggested I went, I, I went to went to um, work. I think their suggestion, my careers officer told me I, could, I should be an agriculture engineer. Which, Obviously, that's not what I wanted to do, working in a field, working on a tractor or whatever. So uh, I found this, this particular job in advertising and thought that's for me and went for it. And, you know, I think I took everything, I went to that job interview with it. I think I took with me everything I'd ever made in my whole life, you know, including a massive box of all this, all this kind of crap that I'd made. Uh, and, uh, but I think the guy was just impressed with my sheer enthusiasm, which is probably why I got the job. But I got the job and that's really set me on my path. It taught me how to, how to make stuff. I set my own company up in Birmingham. That didn't work out too well for me. I ended up, ended up in a creditors meeting at the age of 23. Not where you want to be. But what it taught me is not, not how not to run a business. Right, well the first business, we uh, basically ploughed loads of money into a business that we believed was going to work. Um, and it was all to do with, you know, we were producing specialist equipment for the, for the metalworking industry. So it was design and manufacture. Big projects, well, big at the time, 50, 60,000 pounds a time. So we do a huge project over a couple of months, then there'd be nothing. We have to go and search for another project. It, those times are very difficult for us. What I learned from that was I wanted a business I could grow incrementally. Um, so I started with, when I started Roadstock, I started with a few small customers that were spending a thousand pounds a month on fairly easy parts to produce. I satisfy their requirements and then build upon that. Then I get the next customer another thousand pounds a month and just keep building and building and building. You can spend a lot of time and energy chasing these huge contracts, but actually, um, my personal belief is that we, you know, we're better off, you know, servicing lots of small customers really well. So I started with um, my first machine was a Ward Capstan 1A, uh, which was uh, actually re rebuilt in 1961. So I don't know how old it was. I paid 200 pounds for that from some guy in Cheltenham. Set it up in a pig shed up in uh, Wickham Ford, and I could produce. These particular pins that we used to make, I could make 500 an hour on that machine, uh, which is pretty, uh, I rigged it up with air, an air feed bar, homemade bar feed unit, uh, which was great, worked really well, but I ended up uh, with carpal tunnel and repetitive strain in injuries, you know, from that. Well, um, the homemade bar feed, so what I did basically was got a piece of, it's just a piece of angle iron feeding the bar into the machine, and I had a, a little, um, pneumatic cylinder with a grabber basically that grabbed the bar and another cylinder pushed the bar into the uh, into the into the head of the machine so as soon as you open the collar chuck lever hit a small um, micro switch which is a well, pneumatic micro switch which literally just triggered the, uh, the, the the device to clamp the bar and, and ram it into the into the headstock of the machine against a uh, a tool that was there waiting to, um, to, to to act as a dead stop. But ultimately the machine worked really well. I don't think it would pass any health and safety tests these days, but it got me where I needed to be, and, you know, which was ultimately by my first, uh, you know, to get to the position where we could afford to buy our first star machine and justifying that, which was great. So uh, my first star really kind of showed me the way for the full automated, full power of true automation, because those machines uh, are um, truly automatic in, in terms of where you can run a machine for 60, 70 hours completely non-stop without any human intervention on the right kind of work. Um, automation is the future. There's no point in holding away from it. It is what it is. What it is. Um, it's, it, you know, to in order, in order for us to be, uh, you know, a, a, 
if, you know, manuf manufacturing force in the UK, you know, of, um, of consequence, then we need to have embrace technology and use it in the right way and actually trailblaze the technology that we're using. I think that automation is a positive thing all around. Um, but in terms of the machine operators, currently it's quite a boring job. Um, it gives people the opportunity to have more job progression and also be more effective in the workplace and working in synergy with the new technology. Um, it also gives the company potentially more chance to be cost effective um, and um, competitive in the industry on a global level. I think there's a, it's a fantastic industry to be involved with. It's exciting, it's moving forward quickly. At the end of the day, this is a technology industry. People seem to forget that. People talk about engineering and factories in terms of old school, messy, dirty places to work. It's not like that anymore. Take a look around. You know, we're surrounded by, by millions and millions of pounds worth of top grade equipment. But yeah, and the people that we always, you know, it's a, all this equipment creates huge opportunities for creative thought in new ways of approaching work. Um, and uh, ultimately making us efficient and competitive on the global, in the global stage, really. But when does the return for investment kick in? I guess, um, I guess, I guess it, it doesn't really because we're always investing. So, I mean, you, you can't really sit back and get all the returns until you stop investing, I guess. Maybe that's wrong, but in my eyes, it's just we're always spending money. So what we get, we spend on new kit, we keep growing, we keep, we keep employing new people, we keep getting improving our skills. Ultimately, if I was spending, you know, if I was if I was buying lots of laser cut parts every month, for instance, I was at the point where I was spending three or four grand a month on laser cut parts, I'd go and buy a new laser cut set. That's just the way we've always been, you know. You've heard from Paul there, but let's get down to the nitty gritty. Let's find out what is happening in those cells and what Paul classes as their winning combination. Yeah, so we've got a, a Nakamura NTRX 300 here. Um, we can start with the, the halter robot we've got here. So this is the stacker robot. We can load up to 20 kilos, uh, um, a, a 20 kilo billet at any time. Um, we can actually get a, a ton, almost a ton of parts on the bed. Um, so we did a job recently uh, where we had, I think, over 100 parts on the bed, which is about 36 hours of running, sort of complete. Um, and obviously then that, that will load it into the machine. The machine is obviously a, uh, a twin spindle um, uh, machine with a, with a full five axis B axis head. Um, so the parts were coming off complete, um, 36 hours of running with uh, little to, to zero intervention from, uh, from anybody. Um, uh, just sort of monitoring the tool wearing and the tips and things like that. Um, we've also got a hydro feed bar feed which can bar feed up to 65 mil uh, in diameter, um, which is obviously great to have as well. And then we've also got the Renishaw probing. Um, we've got the part probes, so we can uh, so we can measure the, the, the jobs while they're on there. So, ultimately, you can load this up, let it machine, and it'll come off complete in, in a nutshell. Yeah, in a nutshell, that's that's the great thing about this cell. We can we can almost uh, turn the lights off, uh, leave, uh, and come back uh, 24 hours later, and there's a load of uh, parts waiting to, waiting to go to the customer. As a rule of thumb, I will always uh, massively over, uh, I will always overspec the machine as much as I can afford to to try and leave doors of opportunity there for myself, you know. So we buy a machine based on where we need more tuning capacity or more milling capacity, so we wouldn't just buy a standard miller. You know, you might get away with buying a, a low-cost, you know, production machine that's 30, 40 grand, but actually, you know, we'd rather go and buy a full-on five-axis, whatever, for 180 grand, knowing that we can actually do the stuff we would wanted to do it 20% of the time, leaving us a load more capacity to deal with a more, you know, intricate, work or learn more, you know, learn more about the machine or the technology we're looking to get involved with or whatever, you know. So we've always had a quite a, um, a bold view to investment and we've always gone with, we've always tried to be the first with new technology. I mean, we bought this new MX100 recently from ETG, which is a fantastic piece of equipment, the first one in Europe. You know, we, I could see that machine, see straight away what the manufacturers of the machine, that can know where they were going with it and what, where, were they, where, where were they aiming that technology at. And to be honest, it's been a fantastic piece of equipment already. We can see huge, um, huge benefits, um, but you've got to be willing to spend the time to embrace the technology. So now we've found out about the winning combination cell, but let's look at parts. Now, most people would probably look at this part and think, right, five axis mill. Well, Rotec didn't choose that route, and let's find out why. Typically, that part there looks like a five axis machine part, but you sort of turn convention on its head, yeah, so when we got this part, we sort of, uh, we, we really looked at one of these machines, the NTRX, and sort of uh, decided to think out of the box a little bit. And, and if, you, if you take the core of what these machines are, they actually can be a five axis milling machine just flipped on their head. So we used a two jaw chuck on the main spindle, 
and, uh, and three jaw pie jaws on the on the sub spindle to pick up on. Uh, we milled the part on the machine. Uh, we loaded it with a with a house of robot and unloaded it with a house of robot and, uh, and had a part off complete. Um, so in there, you said about you know doing all the inspection, tooling, yeah. and natural component. Yeah, so we, we got the Renishaw probes in these machines. So um, before, but when we loaded up the part, we, we would go in there with the Renishaw probing and and, uh, and just probe the parts up. Dare I say, no operator intervention, but in terms of cycle time, big qu leading question. So cycle time, yeah, it, it did take a, a small hit, probably around 15% uh, reduction, in, in, sorry, increase in cycle time. Um, but subsequently, because you got the robot loading cell there, um, you get such relentless running. Um, that, uh, that it sort of over, outweighs the, the, the small increase in cycle time. So I think we were, versus having it on a milling machine, we were running about 35% more efficient. Well, it's, it's exciting and it's scary and sometimes it's fantastic. Sometimes I think, Christ, what have I done? Why? <laughs> but, you know, it's just all those things all together. I guess it's a, it's, it creates, you know, it's created a, it's an interesting life for me and the people, I think the people around me, I think we've all enjoyed, you know, have enjoyed the journey, continue to enjoy it, and that's what life's all about, as they say, you know. Um, my, only, uh, my only wish, uh, the only thing I could change is that, uh, you know, if we could all live a bit longer so we could, you know, see where we could take it, you know, over the period of, you know, a longer time. But um, ultimately, you've just got to try and make it as enjoyable and fulfilling as you can. And I think what, we, what you do in the workplace is important, is as important as what you do at home, really. That's, I guess that's all I could say on it. That's what it feels like to me. I mean, how sometimes you can get a bit fraught out there with we're trying to, you know, trying to make use, use technology that's not been used in a way that is, it was envisaged, and trying to make things do things they're not designed to do or don't want to do. But when you actually get there and make it work properly, it's very fulfilling for everyone concerned. I think.